Uh, good morning. I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 13th meeting in 2015. I ask everyone in the public area as well to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent. Apologies from Jane Baxter. I move to item one on the, the agenda, taking business and private or decision. The committee is invited to consider our work program under item three in private. Are you agreed? Yes. Item two, fire and rescue service reform. It's our first item of business today, and it's our latest evidence session on reform in the Fire and Rescue Service. We hold these sessions regularly to allow us to keep an eye on how fire reform is working in practice. I welcome the meeting Pat Waters, Chair of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Board, Alistair Hay, Chief Officer of the SFRS, Steve Torrey, Her Majesty Chief Inspector of the SFRS, and Stephen Thompson, Scottish Secretary of the FBU Scotland. Can I thank you all for your written submissions? And I'll go straight to questions from members. Yes, Christian and then Margaret, and then, um, sorry, just let me take my time, Alison, and then John. Right, off we go, and then Roddy. That's a list, okay. Thank you very much, Governor. Good morning. Uh, I just want to go straight to the most important part of this all this reform programme, which is, in fact, the funding aspect of it, and uh, how much is going to be a challenge uh, to meet as a, as a the funding uh, that we need uh, to address in the next few years. I, I read in one of the, uh, and I think it's uh, from the submission from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, uh, some details on, uh, on the reduction which uh, we need to have, which is uh, a reduction by 31.5% cash terms in 2012-2013. And uh, it says that it's primarily due to VAT and pay inflation. I think pay inflation, we all agree that uh, in, in, in those days, uh, it's not a bad thing. Uh, regarding VAT, I, we don't have the details of how much uh, the VAT has affected uh, the funding, and if that, ha that decision was to be reversed by a next Westminster government, will that sort out the problem of funding that we have, uh, the challenges that we have in the next few years to come? Uh, yes, I'll, by the way, I meant to say that if you just indicate you want to answer, and I'll call you. Pat Waters, please. Yeah. Uh, uh, Chair, if I could maybe uh, initially uh, cover the VAT point and then hand over to the Chief Officer, who will cover the other points there. I mean, VAT has been a burden on the, the organisation. Um, I think it's fair to say that we are the only fire and rescue service in the whole of the UK that's actually burdened by having to pay VAT. Every other fire and rescue service in the UK um, uh, gets the, their VAT returned to them or they don't pay VAT as a part of the service that they're actually providing. Now, people would say, and people have said to me, but you knew that when you started, and I did. But there's been certainly subtle changes um, in the two years um, that we have been a fire and rescue service. For instance, the transport agency, which was formed very recently down south to a national agency, very similar to um, the formation of a national service in Scotland for the fire and rescue service, is exempt from VAT. Uh, they, there was a change in the regulations to allow them to be exempt. There are other organisations that had re that recently formed international organisations that are also exempt, and the government has made an exemption. You know, it's a matter very much for the Westminster government. And certainly, if we look at it, uh, last year it cost us £10 million in VAT. That's £10 million that we wouldn't have had to look for savings within the service, and it would have protected part of the service ongoing. Yeah, so there, it is important to our own going financial situation. Will it cover all the gap? No, it won't, but it certainly would go a long way to help us. On that particular point, uh, did you ask for uh, an, uh, uh, a modification on the VT Act 1994 under Section 33 that you, the fire service will be in Scotland will be added to it? Because I, I've noted that the BBC is on it, as, and uh, we've got the Metropolitan Police, Police is on it as well. So have you asked specifically for that modification to be made? I wrote to the Prime Minister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and every Scottish MP with a copy to uh, my colleagues in the Scottish Parliament for their information. Um, the, return, the replies that I got was that there are regulations, there are people, organisations that were exempt, but we were not one of them. But no reason was given? No. Can I we say have, that, have uh, we seen? Uh, can we have a copy? Of, or have we seen that letter of response that you had? Probably not, Christine. I'm so, quite happy to actually. Could we? That. Yes. And, and the other thing I'd like to, to exemplify, and you've mentioned, uh, Christian, other organisations, the BBC and the Met. 
you said other recently formed organisations, but you didn't elaborate. I mean, do you know them? Yes, the the, the London Legacy Organisation was formed international organisation. Sorry, the, the the Olympics Legacy Organisation okay. was formed international organisation to see the benefits of Olympics spread throughout right throughout. That was a local body that was formed into a national body, but is made VAT exempt. Okay, that's very useful. Uh, Christian, yes, are you finished, Christian? No. Yep, I think Mr. Hay. Mr. Hay wanted to. Yeah. Um, perhaps just to highlight a couple of things. Um, you know, first and foremost, what what I and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service are concerned about is ensuring, uh, you know, the safety and improving safety outcomes for the people of Scotland. Um, in terms of the funding gap that's mentioned here, um, we have reduced the cost base of the organisation by £48.2 million um, in the first three years of the service. That's including this financial year uh, of the service. So the reduction that we anticipated uh, when we formed the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, we've been able to deliver against that. But it has been made uh, more difficult uh, because it's not just the cash cut in the organisation, it's also the increase in the cost base, which has been exacerbated by the fact that we have not been VAT exempt. So I would absolutely support if the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and as the Chair just said, we are the only Fire and Rescue Service in the UK that is paying VAT on goods and services, and it certainly would have helped us over the past three years, but certainly as we look to the future, and we're not anticipating... Uh, that we will see any significant increase in our funding, that exemption would be a very useful and powerful thing to help to um, improve safety outcomes for the people of Scotland. And if I can just add that you know, we have been set you know, six key targets by um, Scottish Government, but if I could just highlight perhaps two to you. Uh, one is around uh, reducing the number of casualties, uh, including fatalities and fires, and the other one is around reducing the number of casualties, including uh, fatalities in special services, uh, and both of these key safety targets, despite the fact that we have <coughs> successfully reduced the cost base by £48.2 million, uh, both of these key targets have been met by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and that is absolutely our focus, the safety of our communities. Could, could Does any other panel member on the VAT issue wish to comment? Just have indicated. No, right. Well, sorry. Could you maybe quantify because I, I didn't. Ha you know, it says it mixed VAT and pay inflation together. Could you try to quantify a little bit what difference it would make in in the figures? We're paying circa ten million pounds per annum on VAT for goods and services procured by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And you asked to make what kind of saving per year? Well, for, we for the next year to come. Over, over the, the first three years of the service, and we don't know what our budget would be beyond this financial year, uh, we have had to reduce the cost base by £48.2 million. So if you took that, that £10 million uh, off, you'd be saying £38.2 million, which would free up an additional £10 million to invest in a vital public service. So you will make a big difference. Thanks very much, Wallace. Rod, do you have a supplementary? Uh, uh, supplementary. When um, Chief Constable um, House was before us in November. He said that the failure to recover 23 million was the equivalent of, I think he said, 680 police officers. What's the, that 10 million equivalent of in terms of fire officers? Anyone? About 350 uh, firefighter posts. A firefighter with on course is earning around about 30k per annum. Thank you. Um, it's just a small is it, is it still on the it's same? It's a supplementary, yeah. all right? Yeah, it's just a simple question. I, I mean, I hear what you're saying about writing uh, to the government, but I, I just looked up the criteria uh, with regards to registration, and in there it says you must uh, register if you're a, a, with a turnover more than £82,000 uh, per annum. Has anyone actually tried to register? Because my understanding is that it may, may be by law that um, HMS uh, Customs might need to actually take a different view uh, because there's law state, uh, laid down. That might sound like a silly laddie question, but has anyone ever tried to register <laughs> rather than ask the questions? Um, the, the, the short answer is no, we have not, because we were told we would not, we would not yeah. be covered for it. Right. In any event, we're going to see who was the uh, the response was from was it from the treasury or it was from the treasury. Right, so we are happy to see the response that you yeah, have. Thank you very I much. I will make sure that's forwarded.
Um, Margaret, please. Both the joint submission and the submission from the Chief Inspector state there has been a reduction in emergency response demand for um, the SFRS and a reduction in the traditional firing, firefighting intervention roles. Now, I think legally that covered um, prevention of fires and to save people from fires and road accidents. Is the new unitary fire force able now to cover incidents such as the tragic case of Alison Hume, where, because of health and safety reasons, then there was a delay of, of six hours in rescuing her from a mine shaft? And is it clear if the fire brigade would have a role in, say, um, the collapse of a building or in um, a mine shaft collapsing or in flood prevention, but specifically the kind of um, scenario that we saw in that tragic case. Okay. Yes, um, when the Fire Scotland Act came in, it actually um, replaced the 1947 Fire Services Act, uh, and it recognised that we no longer just fight fires. Uh, it put an increased emphasis on the preventative work uh, and, and I would commend the preventative work that has been undertaken by the Fire and Rescue Service because that has played uh, a significant part in that 40 per cent reduction in the number of emergency incidents that we attend. But what it also recognised was that um, the Fire Service had developed uh, expertise, uh, the skills, it had procured uh, much of the equipment to enable it to respond uh, to other types of emergency incidents, um, such as collapsed buildings, as you specifically mentioned there. Uh, we would call that urban search and rescue, uh, and you may well be aware that there's a, uh, a, a terrible tragedy unfolding in Nepal uh, at this moment in time, and there are six members of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service who have those very skills are supporting the UK's response to that. So we have those types of skills uh, within the service. Uh, they are enshrined uh, within the new Fire Scotland Act 2006, uh, uh, so we are equipping our people. Uh, we are um, upskilling our people so that they can respond to these types of incidents. Uh, we've recently undertaken a review of all our specialist capabilities because one of the benefits of reform uh, was to make sure that across Scotland, based on risk, people had a more equitable access to these specialist skills so you would not see undue delay. Uh, that was approved by our board in January and we're working through an implementation plan to make sure that based on risk, People have equitable access to all these types of specialist skills. Um, you know, specifically, uh, you know, in, in, in relation to something like a, a collapsed mine shaft, and this would actually also apply to many other incidents. It would not just be a single response from the fire and rescue service. There would be a multi-agency response to that. We have other people that have uh, complementary skill sets that would form uh, an effective team to undertake such a rescue. Um, so, for example, I can point to, you know, Mind Rescue, uh, who are based, uh, you know, in Fife, uh, at Cross Keys in Fife, or Cross Gates. Uh, so, we have uh, colleagues in other emergency services that would form teams with us, but one of the things that we are doing as the Fire and Rescue Service is we are act acting as the champion of specialist rescue. So, within our control rooms, uh, we are keeping registers uh, of all the people who have additional complementary skills that could work alongside us in these unique and unusual circumstances uh, so that we can deliver as an effective uh, response as we possibly can in those circumstances. And another significant change that we've made within our control rooms is that traditionally, if I was an instant commander uh, at, a, at an emergency incident, the control would give me the predetermined attendance for the type of incident and any, any additional resources I would ask for them from the incident ground. That can still happen, but to support the incident commanders, the control rooms now come in and say, are you aware that 30 minutes away we have this resource, we have this resource, which may help you? So we're trying to make sure that by working with others, but also by acting as a coordinator and changing some of our operational practices, uh, we can give us an effective a response to people uh, that are trapped in whatever circumstances. I suppose the key thing is you've mentioned working as a team, and if it wasn't quite your job to do a specific aspect, and there was going to be a delay in time, and I think that was a key to the case I mentioned, 
are you still confident you could respond appropriately in a common sense manner? Because it seemed to have been the delay in that in that case, uh, which which eventually led to the the tragic death. Um, we've been doing um, lots of work with our colleagues within the Fire Brigade Union. Uh, we've been doing lots of uh, work with the Health and Safety Executive. There's been a major review of instant command procedures and the operational doctrine that operates within not just the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, but also uh, you know, right across the UK to make sure that when we were at, when, when we were at these uh, unusual and very challenging uh, operational incidents, we are able to uh, absolutely respect the health and safety requirements of emergency service workers. They deserve, you know, to, to although they work in an inherently dangerous environment, uh, they need as safe a system as work as we can possibly create from them. But we've got to strike the right balance because we are an emergency service. Uh, and when people are in, you know, difficulty, when their life is threatened, we have a responsibility uh, to respond uh, as safely as we can for our workers, but equally uh, you know, we have to place ourselves into an inherently dangerous environment to try and effect a rescue where that is practicable to do so. Uh, it is not an absolute. It is something that is one of the judgment calls that an instant commander uh, has to make. But what we are trying to do is create the correct environment, create the correct operational doctrine and the right guidance to make sure that our firefighters uh, and our instant commanders understand that making risky decisions is part of their job. Uh, so that's something we've been working very hard on within the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, Mr Thompson. Yes, yes, yes Mr Thompson. Thompson. Yeah, well, first of all, I would reiterate that we are working, the Fire Brigade Union are working very closely with the service to make sure that type of incident doesn't happen again as best we can. However, I just wanted to provide a bit more clarity on the reduction in intervention uh, figures that you first mentioned, and the Chief Officer mentioned a 40% reduction in uh, fire uh, attendance over the last 10 years. What I will say, that intervention activity has only ever sat at around 5% of fire station firefighter activity. Mm -hmm. So it's just to put that 40% into context. So it's a 40% reduction of that 5% intervention activity. That's not to say... Well, Activity. Do you mean going to a fire? Going, going to fire, yes. And you Sorry, have to, you know, all, I know you all know the language, <laughs> yes. but just, it's hard. I will try. For me, make it easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, going to fires. Although we do carry out an awful lot more intervention activity over the past few years, including you know, going to flooding, going to you know, special rescues, going to line rescue, going to water rescue, and that also uh, means there's an increase in activity on fire stations because they are quite specialist skills and you've got to train very intensely for that. So I just wanted to put that 40% reduction in intervention into context. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. Margaret, are you finished? Yes. Um, I'm not sure I've got a categorical yes. Of course, there's got to be a risk assessment. There was a risk assessment in this case, which was less than adequate. So um, I, I'm not altogether sure that, um, albeit a very small number of cases we may be talking about, the effects can be cataclysmic and, and very serious. So... Um, maybe just to reflect on that. But on a more positive note, then, there is an opportunity to, to do other kind of work out of um, hospital cardiac, uh, uh, cardiac arrest, a strategy for that. Would you like to comment on, on perhaps um, work being taken forward to, to do take some Mr. of that Mr. Torrey work? first, then I'll take Mr. Thompson. Mr. Torrey. Thank you very much. So just to be clear, that <coughs> comment in the inspector's submission about reduced operational activity we are presenting as an idea that the service has new capacity and there's opportunities to do different things. So, so it's much more than the very specific, although a very, very pertinent specific question you had, then this is much bigger picture stuff and thinking about what fire and rescue service can do in future. Now the chief painted a very good picture of specialist um, rescue and, and other services that the fire and rescue service provides. On top of that, what we know is the Scottish Government is very keen that the public sector breaks down kind of traditional barriers between organisations and people do different things. So one of the ones that we've tried to highlight to the committee today is this idea about um, corresponding out of hospital cardiac arrest, something that we think the Fire and Rescue Service could make a very, very big difference with. It's not the only thing, of course, and the Fire and Rescue Service will evolve and change, I expect, over the years, but it's something that is very, very current on the agenda and, and something that we've been focused on as an inspector and are trying very strongly to promote. Can you just explain to me, again in simple, <coughs> sorry to yeah, yeah. repeat this, but you, you talk about out of hospital cardiac arrest. Now, is that somebody phones the fire 
and rescue service rather than the ambulance. What happens? You know, uh, give me a wee example of what, what you mean by this change in service or flexibility or whatever. So, so this is something where a member of the public walking along the street okay. suffers a cardiac arrest, falls down. Now, the Scottish Government have very recently an announced a strategy to try and improve outcomes with that. We, we're told um, that if that happens to you in Scotland, it's one of the worst places in Europe for it to happen in terms of survivability. Most places are fairly dramatically different. And all it requires is this. I'll, ju I'll just take you through very, very briefly. All it requires to make improvement is, is three or four steps. Firstly, someone has to recognise that you have suffered a cardiac arrest. Then someone needs to know how to do good quality CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, um, chest compressions. Um, then you need a quick call to, to specialists, to paramedics, and finally you need transport to a centre of excellence. So if you think about that, you know, all over Scotland, the geography, someone falling down in a street anywhere, then ambulances are highly unlikely to be around. It's much more likely a member of the public's going to spot you. But also you've got many thousands of firefighters who are around, trained and can be, can be trained further, who carry hundreds and hundreds of um, defibrillator devices and who could contribute in a big way to that. Very, what is a very, very straightforward process but could make a big, big difference to Scotland's health. So if somebody phoned 999 just now, you know, they saw it in the street and they don't know how to handle it, they're in a remote place, would that be directed... How would that be directed? That, be directed to the ambulance service, but not yeah. necessarily to fire and rescue that be yeah. nearby? Is that what exists just that, now? That would be right. The, the ambulance control room has expertise to understand these things and to assess what's going on, to provide advice. What the fire and rescue service could do okay. is provide an additional resource that Scottish ambulance could call on. And this is part of what you're talking about here? Yes. Somebody else want to comment in the panel about that? Well, and it seems I mean, a certainly very sensible thing to do. It, but it's absolutely sensible thing. You I mean um, in any of the discussions that we've had, in any of the presentations that we've had, um, it's very, very clear. It needs more than than one or two people to actually respond to an incident such as that. Um, I think the 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 main point that, that Steve touched on is that people have to recognise it. For people to recognise it, we need to make the awareness very much more than it is at the present time. And the training opportunities that we would have to use our facilities and our staff to actually make the public aware of exactly what it was and how to deal with it when it yes. happened. I don't think people were suggesting that people phone the fire, the fire station as soon as anything happens. But certainly if, if an ambulance couldn't get there, their staff would phone us. You know, nine times out of ten, we'll get there first. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, It'll come on. Oh, it should come on automatically. Uh, th there are some challenges around about this in the fire service and the FU members getting involved. The first challenge is that at the moment there is a, a conference policy, national policy, that we don't get involved in corresponding schemes. However, our conference is just, just over two weeks away in May where this very issue will be being discussed. It's this being discussed in the broader sense of emergency medical response and should fire and rescue services across the UK or should FBU members get involved in these schemes. There, are currently, there is currently a National Joint Council working group set up on all things uh, emergency medical response and in fact one of our assistant chief officers uh, sits in that working group and obviously FBU at a national level sit in that working group looking at that. Now, that's not to say we, won't, we haven't spoken to the service about this, but all we've said is, you know, can you please you know, take cognizance of the fact that of this, this challenge at the moment, and we'll have to wait and see if there's a change in policy uh, next, next month. On the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest issue, uh, that's only one small part of emergency medical response. Uh, the Fire Brigade Union did attend, along with uh, service managers, the, the symposium you know, um, sponsored by the Scottish Government a couple of months ago in Edinburgh, and... There was a, a presentation given by a captain from the Seattle Fire and Rescue Service, and because they've, they've taken this on board, and you know their calls have uh, increased dramatically, and the firefighters take great pride in being involved in this. And you know, Pat's absolutely right; it seems very sensible to get involved. However, one of the things that did strike me that, that uh, Captain Larson uh, spoke about was that the training for the control operators, dispatchers, they call them, was was absolutely paramount, and it was touching on the point you made that how would how would the fire service be mobilised? That's a key point for us. Another key point is that you know proper training is given for our firefighters. At the moment, 
You know, occasionally we do get in fact more than occasionally now we have been turned out to assist the ambulance service where sometimes the ambulance service are some 30, 40 minutes away where firefighters aren't paramedics. They do have some basic skills on the whole. But I mean, one example I was given anecdotally was that they were, a crew were turned out and it turned out not to be a cardiac arrest, but it was a, a diabetic induced coma. Now, firefighters aren't trained. They don't have that expertise to deal with that. And they're left in the position of having to deal with that casually, surrounded by their family and very, and they just come away from a car fire. So they're all you know, stinking of smoke and noxious chemicals. So. These are the issues that need to be looked at, and we are prepared to speak, and we are speaking to the service about, before we roll this out, you know, can we look at all these issues properly and make sure, and one of the big ones is resources. You know, how is this going to be resourced? Because if, uh, indeed, uh, you roll this out across the whole of the service, then you know, the retained, in particular, the, the retained duty system, then that will have a cost implication to the service when budgets are already stretched. Every time a, fire apply, a retained fire appliance turns out, with four, five, or six firefighters on it, that way that I would guess cost the service between 150 and 200 pounds uh, around that. So, if that is going to be rolled out across the country, then that will have a significant impact on budgets. So, again, the resourcing issue needs to be looked at quite clearly. So, we've touched on training, touched on the, the control issues, resourcing. That needs to be looked at. So, we will continue to, to look and have dialogue with the service on it. And we're not being obstructive on it, but just we're asking the service to, to no, no, you know, I don't, I'd off, take you know, your point. Um, I think these are, these are they're quite serious issues yes. and uh, need to be looked at appropriately. No, no, Thanks. it's it's a very interesting, but it's a very complex matter. Yes. And I take <coughs> your point on behalf of your members. Alison, is this on this point still? No, it's a different point. Well, this is a very brief one, Christian, yeah, on that point. Thank you very much, because I think it's very important to know that redefining the role of the firefighters in the 21st century, they have been used to be involved in it. But uh, I just wanted, Inspector, checking on the Chief Inspector Tory, on what you said about the example in Europe. I know that a lot of things saying about the creativity of the Scottish government on that particular subject. But by a good example in Europe, I think that a lot of first response is done on health, is done by a fire service across France Europe. France is about to focus in yeah. here, is it? Is France coming in, is it, I, Christian? I, I just wanted to check if you had that kind of example over Europe when you say the, the, the fire service is a lot more performant on that particular things on health particularly. If there are maybe some models we can look at. Yeah, that's correct. Yes, but just, just one caveat yes, on that. France. <laughs> yeah, France, France. France is a good model. And there are examples <laughs> across Europe. And, and, but my argument, importantly, my, my argument is that the Fire and Rescue Service can play a very, very big role. But the whole um, um, health care and you know, improved outcomes is, is much bigger than the fire service. It's a whole national thing, a whole national system. You're involved in the integration of the health and social care services. Are you, is the fire service involved in this? In Scotland at the moment, no. Not, not no, just now? No, the, the, the service is in, in conversation with Scottish Army and yeah. the Scottish Government about doing this work. Mr Hay. Just very quickly on, on, on this point, out of hospital cardiac arrest. The ambition is to save 1,000 lives by 2020. And that's 1,000 people returning to their families and being active citizens. Uh, and there is strong evidence from not just Europe, but from all around the world that, a, a, again, it's a team approach. It's a corresponding model with you know, our professionals within the Scottish Ambulance Service and using you know, the team ethic, the skills that firefighters have, the equipment. We have 400 de de defibrillators uh, located across Scotland. If you join that together, we will save a 1,000 lives a year. And, and I absolutely accept you know, all the points around making sure that the control room staff have the, the proper training, that our frontline staff that are responding to these things don't just have the technical skills, they also have the soft skills to deal with families uh, in distressed uh, circumstances. Uh, we have to get all these things right, and it's been a very constructive dialogue we've had to date with our colleagues within the FBU. Uh, but as I'm speaking, and I've visited over 200 work locations, uh, as I'm speaking to the firefighters, they absolutely understand that they can make a significant difference here. Uh, and we will pick on the best practice from wherever it exists in Europe or across the world. So in Scotland, you've got a 4% survival rate at the moment. Uh, and the best um, countries in Europe at the moment, which are the Scandinavian countries, and I recently visited Finland, it's around about 34%. That is an enormous difference. The world leaders are Seattle, uh, and they are saving 40%. Uh, so that yeah, is the ambition, that if we join this up, and as the Chief Inspector says, we cannot do it alone. Uh, it will absolutely require 
us working as the public service and incorporating uh, you know, the third sector. Uh, there's lots of volunteers doing great work. If we join that up and do it in a coordinated way, I see no reason why we, we cannot be up there amongst the best in the world. And that's absolutely something we need to commit to. Thank you. Thank you. Alison. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. This time last year, I think John Duffy of the FBU told us the routine service was on its knees. Mr Torrey, I think you were a wee bit more circumspect and you said it was fragile. Um, can I ask what the service has done over the last year to tackle that problem? Can I, can I, can I come in initially and then, then hand over to the Chief? Uh, I mean, I think at that same meeting there was no disagreement from um, uh, myself as the chair of the service or from the chief officer of the service um, that we have got a, a very vulnerable part of the service, and that is a retained firefighting unit. It is a large part of the service we deliver, a very important part of the service we deliver. And that since the, the, the meeting we had last year, we've had uh, a piece of work being done with one of our senior officers in conjunction with the retained service itself and with the, our uh, representative unions as well, uh, looking about how we can... We don't believe, and I think we said at that particular point, um, that there would be many attempts to actually uh, repair that service. We believe we need a new approach to how we deliver that service, and that was the effort we are putting into that. We have looked at how it's been delivered in, in other countries, but for the detail, I'll, I'll hand over to the Chief Officer. OK. Um, just quickly to recap... 40% of the operational firefighters in Scotland work on the retained duty system and 90% of the land mass in Scotland is protected by retained duty firefighters. They are you know, an integral part of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, they have um, been magnificent uh, in protecting their local communities, but it was a system that was designed for the 1950s uh, when lifestyles were significantly different. Uh, we need to refresh that. Uh, because we know that, that during the day, because we have the technology that tells us the availability of every appliance in Scotland, uh, we know that between 60 uh, and up to 100 retained pumps can be off the run at some point, not available at some point uh, during the day, predominantly Monday to Friday, 95. That is a huge you know, challenge for us, and we need to address it. Um, as the Chair just alluded to, uh, this was something that has been growing for probably many decades. Uh, it's not unique to Scotland. You know, it's something that the whole of the UK is facing. Uh, it's a challenge. Each of the antecedent services tried in different ways uh, to address it, but still the problem remains. And it is not, and I stress this, it is not down in any way uh, to a lack of commitment from uh, local retained firefighters. They're doing an incredible job. Um, but the circumstances make it different, uh, d difficult for them. So there's two things that we have done. Uh, we have looked at the existing system uh, and we've tried to eradicate any um, bad practice within it. So we heard some horror stories that when people wanted to join the retained service uh, in the local community, it could take over 12 months for them actually to, from the point of contact to the point of them actually joining a local crew. And many people, you would understand, will fall away during that journey. Uh, so one of the things we've done there is it's now a six, 16 weeks from the point of initial contact to the point where you would uh, commence your training with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, and you, you'll understand, but within, you know, because of the nature of the role, there's things like you know, we have to do background checks and that on people. So there are some delays in there. So we've streamlined that. Uh, what we've also done is increased the involvement of the, the local uh, managers to make sure that they... They, they're involved in it and they involve the local crews within the recruitment process. Uh, and what we've also done is, you know, and I'll give you an example from um, only last week, uh, we were up in um, Shetland and in Orkney. I, I wasn't, some of my managers were, and they were running a, a campaign uh, up in uh, Orkney and Shetland and we're going to train all the firefighters there on the islands as opposed to taking them on to the mainland. So all we've been listening uh, and we've been trying to streamline the processes and we're trying to make it much easier, you know, for people who show willingness, uh, you know, to join the service. And we're trying to, you know, be understanding uh, of the difficulties that they have and perhaps detaching themselves away from their local community, you know, their, their families uh, and, and, and their main uh, form of employment. So we've streamlined that. 
uh, and we are seeing uh, some improvement there, uh, but that is really a stick and plaster. What we think is more important is the work that's going on to redefine what the retained duty system will look like uh, you know, in the 21st century. So, we're, so Peter Murray, who's one of the assistant chief officers, who you heard the last time is leading this project, um, we're about to kick off a couple of pilots uh, around Scotland where what we're going to be looking at is what is the role of a retained firefighter? What other you know, value-adding activity can they uh, um, bring to their local communities that might encourage them uh, to be part of uh, the public service and specifically the fire and rescue service uh, in, in Scotland? So these are just pilots that are going to go. Uh, they're options for the future. Um, if these things are successful, then what we will try and do is learn from them and roll these out uh, across other parts of Scotland where it may be pertinent. But what I would suggest to you is that the retained duty system, uh, if that's what we continue to call it, will, con will, will be extremely significant in the future. Uh, but how it fits into the different parts of Scotland, uh, I think uh, it will not be homogenous. The core will be the same, but we need to make it fit the needs of local communities and the demands that are placed upon uh, the people within those local communities. And that's the future stuff we're working on at the moment. It seems to me you're a long way away from a, a solution then. Can you put a time scale on, <laughs> on this? Um, well, in terms of streamlining the existing processes, uh, we have done that now. So, so that mm -hmm. first stage is, 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 is now complete and we are seeing improvements. Uh, in terms of these pilots, we hope to kick where, off... Excuse me, where, where are you going uh, we, we, well, to we, we, we are hoping that we will run these pilots in East Lothian, Scottish Borders and Aberdeenshire. And uh, when are you expecting to assess the effectiveness? Well, we, we are expecting to kick these pilots off uh, in October um, of this year, but we are still, you know at the stage where we're having the conversations with the chief executives uh, and the leaders within the local authorities. Uh, we're speaking to our colleagues in Scottish Ambulance Service, Police Scotland, and we're also uh, speaking to our colleagues within uh, NHA Scotland as it covers those particular areas, how we gather all this together. Uh, so we, we are hopeful that we'll get some of these, pil these pilots going in October. Uh, and you know, to be fair, you probably need to run them you know, for a period of about 12 months before you could get any meaningful, you know, feedback to these things. This is a long-term strategic problem that, that we have, but we are attempting to, to, to readdress it. But at the same time, we are attempting to make sure that the existing system works as effectively as it possibly can. I mean, if I might just... I was just going to ask Mr Torrey to come in if you want, okay. if you want to come in there first. Mr Torrey? I, I could just add two comments briefly, if I, if I may. The first is... Um, to say that the inspector has obviously a very strong interest in this area. I mean, the chief officer has described how heavily reliant Scotland is on retaining volunteer firefighters. So we know it's a fundamentally important issue. We have reported on it. We will continue to take an interest. And it's one of those things that we want to take an interest in the form of being supportive of the service, trying to drive change and, and, and make a difference, bring about a difference. The other comment I wanted to make was when I, when I chose the word fragile last year to describe the service, that was a very deliberate thing. Um, and that was because although there is this long-term pressure and, and changes in the way the service operates, the service is not broken. So I, I could go around Scotland, interview many, many members of staff who will describe the pressure they're under, but they are delivering a quality service in the local communities. And I think that's really important. I think it's important to the services staff that, that the service is not the retained and volunteer system is not painted as a failing part of the organisation because it is most certainly not. My intention to suggest that it was failing. Um, it's precisely because I value what they do that um, I'm keen that they, 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 they're given that um, support that they need uh, in order to operate. There's been a cluster of recent fatalities in rural areas in Dumfries and Dumfries in the Highlands and in the North East. Are you, are you confident that you have adequate cover across the whole country? Um, the emergency response side is extremely um, important and, and as part of ensuring the safety uh, of Scotland's communities. But when we, every time we have a fatality, uh, what we do is we look at you know, the entire circumstances around it. Um, and last, well not last financial year, the one before, was the lowest number of fire fatalities ever in Scotland, uh, you know, and I think that's a testament to the work that has been done. 
but, but it's testament not only to emergency response but prevention. And we look at these rural communities and we look at the circumstances um, in which, um, unfortunately, people have died. Uh, what we see is two things. Uh, we see that we have an ageing population. Uh, we are, it's a fantastic thing that people are living independent lives longer, but that comes with vulnerability. So how do we work with colleagues within you know, the health and social care reform that's going on to make sure that we recognise these vulnerabilities and stop people getting into the circumstance where, uh, you know, tragically their life's ended through a fire. So that prevention part is extremely important. And the other thing that we've seen, uh, and we're looking into this, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it here uh, today, that um, around about a quarter of our fire deaths last year were suicides. Uh, and we have never experienced that previously. Uh, so again, there are questions that we are asking, uh, and it's early stages around, around um, you know, mental health issues and how we can play a part in understanding, uh, you know, what what is behind all of this. Um, so when we look at these rural areas, um, emergency response does play a part, but the most important part, and, and, and I'm clear on this, is preventing a fire from happening in the first place and understanding why and preventing these circumstances from actually arising in the first place. Okay, thank you. I, I find it, I think we're all quite taken aback by suicides and fires. I mean, it's not something one would yeah. think about, you know. Um, yeah, we, we, we have not, you, you know, sadly, um, people can be in such a distressed state that they decide to end their lives yes. uh, and there's many ways they do that. Uh, we always had a few people, uh, unfortunately, would uh, um, self-immolation, I think is the term, uh, would set themselves on fire. Oh my uh, but um, last year, um, we saw a significant increase in this. Now, it may be just one of, the, you know, one of these anomalies that occasionally occurs, but we're having conversations now uh, you know, with colleagues within that wider health and social care, yes. with our colleagues in Police Scotland to see if this is a pattern, uh, you know, and, and who who's committing suicide in this way, you know, is it a specific group within society? We need to understand these things, uh, you know, so, so that as a collective, uh, we can improve the safety outcomes uh, of the people of Scotland. So, but these are the two things that, that we have noticed. Uh, suicides have increased, and the other thing is, you know, the profile uh, beyond the suicides are elderly, uh, people mm -hmm. living alone, and there's many benefits to that, but we need to recognise and work within the system uh, in terms of the vulnerabilities that can arise from that. Yeah. Thank you. John, followed by Elaine. Yeah, thank you, Kavina. Uh, morning, panel. Can I thank you all for your submissions? They were very helpful. Uh, Mr Hayes, it's a question for you, please, and it is about... Um, you see you no longer just fight fires. It's, there's a broader range of work that you do in the preventative work. I'm particularly interested in the tackling inequalities bit. And I note you say that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is leading in phase two of the Scottish Government's Building Safer Communities programme. And I wonder, and commend the Christie Commission approach that's been taken by the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. I think that's very positive. I absolutely understand Mr Thompson's um, representations on behalf of his members about expanding roles and, and perhaps the expectation that can be built in the public eye um, there. Can you uh, comment on some of that preventative work? Particularly the bit that jumped out to me was when you talked about ensuring that there was robust intelligence data sharing protocols. Your preventative work maybe identifies vulnerable people. Who do you share it with and how do you share it, please? <coughs> If I give you an example from um, our, our colleagues south of the border, um, the, the Chief Fire Officers Association uh, have just agreed um, a protocol with the whole of the NHS in England where they will be sharing appropriately uh, some of the data held by GPs. Uh, they call it the Exeter data. Um, it's not the same name up in Scotland. Uh, but what that helps people to do is identify uh, people that have various vulnerabilities. Uh, so when, and they piloted this in Cheshire, so they did 30,000 home safety visits in Cheshire, and it was intelligence-based, predominantly from uh, information that they got from the NHS. Uh, so that we've done uh, a huge amount of work in terms of home fire safety visits. 
um, across Scotland. Um, I think what we've done is, is not just targeted those that are vulnerable, we've also uh, you know, targeted anybody that wanted a home fire safety visit. In my view, and there's evidence to support this, is what we have done is we've increased the people that will evangelise for safety uh, because we share it with everybody that we know. But what we're seeing is we're getting to a plateau uh, again and the, 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 the evidence from the work that Cheshire have done because they, they, they did that mass and now they've gone to the targeted very much using data they get from the health service. Uh, they're targeting people that may be vulnerable in the way that I just described earlier. Uh, so what that's doing is making sure that the Fire and Rescue Service, because we do have this footprint uh, you know, everywhere, is getting into people's homes uh, because we have uh, you know, that, that, that trust. Uh, we are able to engage with people very effectively, but we are trying to uh, engage with the people that are most vulnerable, and that's an intelligence-led approach that has been supported by our colleagues within the NHS. Uh, so as we speak here in Scotland, uh, there is conversations uh, going on with the Chief Medical Officer. I understand there's a new Chief Medical Officer uh, that's about to come into post. Uh, that will finalise that so that with the right protections, uh, uh, the right protocols in place, we will get that comprehensive sharing of the right data from colleagues within the uh, NHS to enable us you know, to focus and target on the vulnerable people. Thank you. When you say intelligence-led, are you recommended to visit places, your, your officers, um, and if so, who by? And in turn, if you are doing a blanket approach to an area and you encounter someone that's vulnerable, who do you share that information yeah. with, please? Um, the, we're working with colleagues, uh, you know, the exact protocols about how you will share. Uh, we absolutely to get those right. Uh, you know, people have rights to privacy, uh, etc., and you have to respect all of that. Uh, so we're, we're still at the stage at this moment in time, and we'll learn lessons, you know, from our colleagues uh, south of the border about... So can I ask you that? Meantime, information that you would retain yourselves, then. So, so if, if we we will get those protocols right, we're working with uh, you know the, the the people that are leading at a local level in terms of um, health and social care integration, and there's all the existing uh, systems in place so that we get the right the right levels there. If we pick up, uh, you know, through our visits, people that 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 are vulnerable. Uh, then we can have conversations with that individual, but we would also uh, contact our uh, colleagues within health, within social care, you know, to say, little examples, for example, uh, you know, there's a person there that's very frail, uh, they tell us in the home fire safety visit that they've tripped over several times, uh, they have uh, a gas cooker in their house, perhaps an induction hob might be something that might be helpful there are technologies there now where uh, remotely using an app on your mobile phone, uh, you can get an alert saying that somebody's cooker is overheating and it can be switched off remotely. So we have the conversations within that wider team of people that support people that uh, are vulnerable within uh, their homes. I that somebody could switch off my cooker. <laughs> yeah, they could do, they could do that. Uh, so it's having the right conversations with the local, uh, you know, social and health care providers. It has to be a team approach. I can I ask you, John, you've not asked us, but before you get to that, you talk about protocols, but where is the individual in this? How much consent have they given oh, to the sharing of this data? You know, I mean, your aims are worthy, but I, I just wondered, John, if you were... Well, that's to... precisely... Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's maybe me, Mr. Hay. I'm, I'm not clear... Yeah. Um, if there is a, you know, if, if this is something that's been developed, then that's fine, and I appreciate that there are a lot of initiatives literally just kicking off with health and social care. But you also use the word trust, and, and I think the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service enjoys quite yeah. appropriately a high level of trust. And there are a number of vulnerable people in our communities with challenging mental health conditions, for instance, and I wonder what impact that may have. So it's to trying to understand, is there a system in place just now? Is it relatively informal? Is it formal? Are there data protocol sharing? challenges which we're all a, a, a aware of. And Before you even get to data protocol sharing, what consent has to be given by yeah. the individual it's when they go, you, it's very, very specific, it's not just the protocols, it's, for instance, can you share my information um, <laughs> with, who can it be shared with through yeah. the NHS? Well, I think we'd kind of like to know that. You, 
you clearly have protections under the law to protect your privacy. But what we understand is, is the power of intelligence uh, you know, in terms of driving down risk. But equally what we understand is that w when we are designing services, uh, they have to be um, designed in many ways from the bottom up. It's one of the challenges uh, of it's one of the challenges of Christie is that public services shouldn't be done unto people. They need to be they need to be developed uh, with people. That co-production model. So when we are developing these protocols, one of the key questions that will absolutely need to be addressed uh, and answered is how do we get the consent and the support of people, and we don't impose it upon them. So that's why I'm saying that we are in the process at this moment of time in developing these protocols. And, and I would absolutely accept, I would absolutely accept that, that it is with that individual at the heart of it that we have to, un we have to get their support, uh, we have to get their permission within these things, and it's understanding how that happens that will make this a success and not destroy that absolute trust that our communities have in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, because that is one of our key strengths. Again, I'm sorry to labour the point, but there's a challenge within that because some people are perhaps not in a position necessarily to give an informed yeah. consent. So there will be a requirement sometime when there's a superseding yeah. issue of public safety, I'm yeah. sure, where... Yeah. And, and again, and this is, is where you have to make sure to the that, the, that, that as you... You understand the legislation that gives people the protections and you understand the legislation that gives people as a community and a society wider protections and you make sure that the protocols and the practices that you have in place you know address both of these things uh, and it's not it is not a simple answer uh, but as i'm saying we have examples to draw upon uh, from other parts of the united kingdom uh, that will assist us in developing uh, this as we go forward uh, but if we can get this right get that balance right uh, across scotland it will see another significant uh, step forward in terms of ensuring uh, the safety of communities across Scotland. Well, I certainly applaud the, the collaborative work with the Health and Social Care and the other agencies. And perhaps it's something you could keep the committee advised of progress with that, please, Mr. Hay. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you. But permissions being in there as well. I think protocols, practice, but permissions was the bit that was. I, I'll, I'll note that, Mr. <laughs> Mr. And I don't want my cooker switched on uh, by some <laughs> app or other unless okay, necessary. I think you'd upset you'd upset the cat. He'd wonder what was happening, Mr. Torrey. So I just thought I'd help the committee. Um, understand that this is not a theoretical discussion, it's something that is really, really significant. And the, the example I have comes from just prior to reform, a time when Mr Hayes still worked with Tayside Fire and Rescue Service. In that year, there was a series of five fatalities which happened quite quickly. And Tayside Fire and Rescue Service that year explained that each one of those five people was classified as a vulnerable person by health and social care. Some had just been released from hospital, others, others were in the system, but none of those were known to Tayside Fire and Rescue. So if there had been protocols in place with all the controls that you're concerned about, and understandably, then there was at least opportunity for Tayside Fire and Rescue to, to go along and visit and try and, and prevent that fatality happening. Elaine. Hi, thanks. thanks. Um, in this submission from the Fire Brigades Union Scotland, uh, you draw attention to the fact that the numbers of paid, paid firefighting staff have decreased by 4% to the 31st of March 2014, and that was about 290 members, and support staff had also decreased by 12% over that period. And you state that the FBU believe that the reduction in the number of frontline posts is now having an impact on frontline delivery, with either appliances being put off the run due to insufficient personnel being on duty, or a reliance on overtime to crew the appliances which has a knock-on effect on other areas of the SFRS budget. Uh, we know that Police Scotland has a minimum number of police officers of 17,234. Is there a case for a specified minimum number of firefighting staff, or does the service benefit from having flexibility around that? Now, who wants to come first? Mr Thompson. You're absolutely correct. That's one of the major differences that you know, the, the fire services, the, the reform process, unlike the police, without a fixed establishment number. Now, there were different delivery models for delivering the service, different crewing arrangements across the, the, all of the eight. We have done some work, which I did allude to in my uh, submission on resource-based crewing uh, arrangements. Now, that was quite a difficult 
piece of work for us to get involved in, because we were wanting to see an increase in posts and, and the best standards from across Scotland adopted. However, we were quite pragmatic and realistic in realising we were probably not going to achieve that, because I think there was only about three of the legacy services had dedicated crewing remaining. Most had some form of, soft, some form of dual crewing or jump crewing or, or various, various uh, nomenclatures for it. The resource-based crewing model was an attempt to standardise across Scotland the crew arrangement for specialist appliances. So we did that, taking the pragmatic approach. However, we do believe that in terms of rescue appliances, they should still be dedicated crewed. So, and we have, that's a stated aim for us, and about the service are, are well aware of that. However, we believe that even with this reduced crewing model, where you have specialist appliances, rescue appliances, with the exception of height appliances, who are no, they're no longer crewed 24-7, you know, there's other arrangements put in place to do that, that the even if you fully implement that resource-based crewing model, then we believe there are now still insufficient firefighter numbers to crew to the, the preferred options, the delivery options. Now, I think there's only one service that are actually would have, uh, when you adopt that model, is has an over-provision, and that's in the former Lothian and Borders. Um, and every other service, I believe, our former service, had less than what they actually need, even with that reduced crewing model. That's why we now believe that, and that's why we wanted to highlight the reduction in numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, the Scottish Government's aims, I believe, was to protect the front line, the front line delivery outcomes. We believe now that there are, uh, on any given day, there will be appliances not available, whole time appliances available, because there are insufficient personnel and overtime budgets are, you know, way over budget. Mm -hmm. We believe the overtime budget, you know, we are trying to work with the service to mitigate this, uh, the overtime. Um, because we re realise that if the overtime budget overspend, that means I cut somewhere else because of the fixed budget arrangements. But we do believe that money would be better spent in employing and recruiting more firefighters. Mr Hay. Um, at the moment, there's 3,890 whole-time firefighters in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. That obviously moves as people you know, retire and uh, um, transfer into other parts of the country or move into other jobs. But 3,890, um, the target operating model that we have uh, is moving towards 3,709 whole-time firefighters in Scotland. That's what we're working towards. Uh, so we have worked very closely, as, as, as Steve just said, um, with the Fire Brigade Union to, to ag agree uh, this resource-based crew model. Really what that means is our, our standard pumping appliances, the, the fire engines that the public would understand, the whole time ones, they're crewed all the time. Uh, but on stations, uh, we have a number of specialist appliances, specialist resources um, that are infrequently needed, uh, but they're specialist and when they are needed, they are needed. Uh, so the model that we have is um, if that's required, the, the crews that are crewing those pumping appliances would, would take the special appliance to the incident uh, alongside the pumping appliance, and the crew uh, would then be able to use all the specialist equip, equipment on. Uh, this is a model that we've agreed with the Fire Brigade Union, uh, but I would like to give the reassurance that this is something that has been uh, in place throughout Scotland uh, for many decades. Uh, in different parts of the country, and there's nothing that we have agreed that has not got a proven uh, record of being effective and providing a safe system of work. Now, there is challenges uh, in relation to getting uh, the crews uh, that we require for our target operating model into the right places. Uh, you'll remember from previous evidence that uh, you know staff do have uh, mobility protections. Uh, so we cannot move them, you know, from one part of the country where we might have a surplus, you know, to, to other parts of the uh, other parts of the country. Um, we've also we are working through um, <clears throat> our supporting structures, our uniform supporting structures. How many uniform staff have to do training? How many uniform staff have to, uh, you know, provide our uh, specialist fire safety advice? Uh, but at the moment. Um, we have got 3,890. Taking all that into account, we've got we need 3,709, uh, and we will work towards putting that model in place. Uh, and the way that we are working towards that and respecting, uh, you know, our staff is by a judicious use of overtime, and we've also done uh, some recruitment 
uh, specifically in the northeast of Scotland, uh, so that what we made sure was that we had specific shortages and overtime was not really a sustainable option, we did some local recruitment. But as we worked through and looking at our uh, projections in terms of our workforce planning, it will be um, financial year 1617 before we get to the target operating model. Uh, so that, that's what we're trying to do at the moment. But the reassurance I would give is that all the practices that we have put in place have been used in Scotland uh, somewhere, uh, and we've agreed with the Fire Brigade Union that this is a safe system of work. That's, a, that's a, a reduction, a further reduction of 181. I mean, if we're already seeing these sorts of pressures with the loss of st staff, which has occurred already, uh, I mean, this this figure of 3,709, is that budget-driven rather than actually driven on the needs of the service? Um, what we've looked at is what would be a safe and effective crewing model uh, across Scotland. Um, it would be uh, disingenuous of me uh, not not to say that we, ha we have to live within our budget. Uh, we had the opening question around budgets. We've reduced uh, the cost base by £48.2 million. Uh, nearly 80% of our budget goes on staff. Uh, so <laughs> we need to do these things. But we are absolutely, and I as an individual, am absolutely focused on uh, the safety of my communities across Scotland and my staff. Uh, so this model is a, is a model that will be effective uh, and it's also efficient. And if you look at, and I made the point earlier about the key targets that we have uh, about reducing casualties, uh, we're hitting those targets. So, it's a, so we're being more effective, but we're also being more efficient because we're doing it for less money. And one of the key targets, and quite rightly, uh, is that we reduce the number of firefighter injuries because it is an inherently dangerous occupation. And again, we are hitting that target. So we've got an eye on the budget, yes, but we've also got an eye on the fact that we are here to deliver a service for communities. And I'm confident that the model that we've put in place will do that, and it also respects uh, the staff who are absolutely fundamental in delivering it. And of course, if you had that 10 million million yeah. <laughs> you'd be able, if you wished, for another 350, I you know, take it. From and and I, am always, I, I am always an advocate for the Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, it's a wonderful public service. It does incredible stuff uh, for communities. Uh, and we do much, and we could always do more, because it's not just the emergency yeah. response where we add value. It's across many other things. But the issue is this so VAT, this VAT issue pounds. is a huge issue for you. Sorry? I mean, the VAT issue is a huge issue, Massive. which for the life of me... I can't understand why you and Police Scotland are still having it levied, given the examples you're given. You know, everyone's politics are. It just seems just unjust. If, 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 I mean, if that situation was resolved, would you yes. be recruiting more fire, firefighters? I mean, would you actually see an a, a increase, if you like, in the, in the minimum? I mean, uh, well, that, that model mm, that I've mm, said yeah, today I mean, is, would the model change with the numbers is a model that will money. be safe. Mm. Um, I don't know what the budget will be. Uh, mm next financial year okay. or the financial years beyond that, that £10 million, pounds, we'd have to put whether we use it to recruit you know, mm. additional firefighters above that model. I cannot answer that question because I do no. not know no. what the totality of the budget will be. Fair enough. Mr. Thompson. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. The, the, the safe model. Uh, who's to say that the safe model is the best model? And if there were more resources, then I believe there should be more firefighters to produce you know, the best practice, not just the minimum practice, for, you know, to ensure safety. Which is really where we are right now, and we've, why we've been involved you know, closely with the service to mitigate some of the effects. And that's all we're doing. We're mitigating the effects of the cuts. Yes. And that's all. But it's not necessarily best practices that have been put in place. So I take Alistair's point, and I do believe in that he does want a safe system work for every firefighter, but it's not to say it's the best system that could be in place. Uh, he's just, nodding. Yeah. He's nodding with you. So just it's nice to see you agreeing a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, we are. Yes. Actually, just a, a, very, a brief, a, a couple of years ago, a lot of issues around firefighters' pensions, and that was causing quite a lot of concern, both within the uh, the, the newly formed SFRS and, and and the fire brigades unions. Is, is there is that been resolved? Or are there still issues around pensions that are, are causing concern? Mr. Thompson. We are still in dispute with uh, both, both the Scottish Government and the Westminster Government. However, obviously the Scottish Government have 
uh, put a, a set of mm -hmm. uh, proposals in place which did avert strike action in Scotland, as I'm sure you're all aware. Mm -hmm. there, were, there was strike action taken south of the border um, because Westminster government was intransigent and, in fact, the fire minister, we believe, uh, politely we had misled the House when I'm sure you're aware of the emergency uh, the motion that was put in place and the debate mm -hmm. was had in Westminster where the fire minister there said that the same uh, safeguards for firefighters south of the border were in place, as in they wouldn't be left at 55 without a job and without a pension. That mm -hmm. is one of the improvements that the Scottish Government did give us, and mm -hmm. pleased to say it did avert the strike action. It didn't answer all of the parts of the trade dispute. Um, mm -hmm. So we're still, we're still there, but it's not, it's not been resolved as yet in Scotland, but it's, it's, uh, it's we're close. It's better. It's better, yes. Mr Waters. Chair, thank you. I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with Stephen in this matter, um, and, and many other matters as well. Um, can I say that um, it's still a major issue for our firefighters, um, a major issue for firefighters. Um, we have worked with the government and with our uh, trade union colleagues to ensure that the, the impact has been mitigated. But he, Stephen's absolutely right. There is still a dispute between, you know, like, say, the, the union and their employers on this matter. There's a recognition that, as an, as, that the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service can he solve this. There's also a recognition that the Scottish Government has done everything in their power to actually alleviate the, thing, the, 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 the worst uh, of it, but there's still some issues that are not... Um, uh, uh, that the Scottish Government can um, solve, and that's a, a, a discussion for Westminster. We still pursue it at national level through the National Council, but it is still a major issue for our firefighters. Alison, do <coughs> you have a supplementary? I this? do. Chief Officer Hay, you mentioned the m mobility restrictions, and I, I presume that's on a permanent basis, so you can't move officers on a permanent basis. Are you having to rely on moving officers around on a kind of piecemeal fashion in any way um, to cover shortages? <coughs> What we're doing um, at the moment is we're actually actively involved in a discussion with the uh, Fire Brigade Union about um, amending that mobility protection that staff have. So if I, I use a little example for you. If you work within, if, if you were employed by the former Lothian and Borders, then I can move you to any station in Lothian and Borders. Um, but you might live in Fife, uh, in Dunfermline or Kirkcaldy. Uh, so if I was short of a firefighter in um, Dunfermline or Kirkcaldy, I couldn't post you to that station uh, because that's the mobility protection you have. Everybody would see common sense. You know, you're not causing any difficulty to the individual. Same employer, you know, uh, same same job you're asking them to do. So that's the type of sensible discussion that we're having with the FBU at this moment in time to try and get a a, a better mobility uh, situation for people. I don't want to post somebody from Edinburgh to Inverness. You know. I understand that's you know unfair or vice versa if that's how the lifestyle is, but I would want to be able to post people you know to stations that are closer to their homes uh, because it makes sense for the organisation and I don't I don't see that as causing you know too much disruption for them as individuals. Yeah, but wanted to comment on that. Yes, uh, I don't want to go too much further than what the chief has said. I don't want to compromise or. or uh, prejudice any of the negotiations and discussions that are going on. What I will say is the bigger piece of work that needs to happen is that the harmonisation of terms and conditions, which you might think, well, that's quite an easy easy uh, fix because we have a national set of conditions. However, there were eight legacy local arrangements on just about everything. So it's actually quite a big piece of work. If the terms and conditions were harmonised, the local agreements were harmonised, then it would make it an awful lot easier to you know, uh, discuss a mobility clause. So where we're at at the moment is we're looking at protection arrangements if there indeed is, there's an interim mobility clause put in, but further than that, I'd rather not no, go I at the moment. I so. need to start negotiating here, because <laughs> you're all getting on so well, I wouldn't like to see anything happening that would disrupt that. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, Roddy, followed by Gil, please. Um, thank you, convener. Um, 32 local plans, including this one from five. Um, can you just uh, provide the committee with a bit more detail in terms of the local input towards these plans and are they making a meaningful contribution? <coughs> well, uh, Mr well, uh, Waters, yes. I think they are. I mean, it's done through our, our um, local senior officer, our LSOs, 
who are in a constant touch with the individual local authorities in drawing up the plans. Um, the plans, as you know, have to be agreed individually by the local authorities. Um, to date, we have, uh, at the present time, 31 out of 32 authorities have agreed their local plan. Um, one authority hasn't. That was Dumfries and Galloway, and that was an issue uh, probably around about the closure of the control, where they felt aggrieved that the, con the control was closing and that didn't agree the local plan. Um, that still outstanding at this particular point, and ongoing discussions will take place between the service and the Priest and Galloway to try and make sure that the next uh, iteration of the local plan is agreed. But there is involvement at a local level, and there is input, but it's done through the, the local senior officer. But maybe Alistair would like to comment further. Well, Mr Tony wanted to come in first, but that might don't, who wants to go first? Whichever. So, so I'll just add briefly again then um, that the inspectorate, um, has local plans very much on our agenda just now. You might have seen in our submission that we've embarked on a series of local area inspections. So these are council-based inspections. Last month we were up in Aberdeen. There are two reference documents that we're interested in fundamentally. One is the Fire and Rescue Framework, which is the Scottish Government's way of describing its expectations on the service. And the other is a local plan. So in the next few weeks you will see a publication from the Inspectorate on the City of Aberdeen and which makes explicit comment on the local plan. And we'll be, we'll be assessing those as we're going around the country this year. And towards the end of the year, um, we will be compiling a, a kind of national overview report, which we're likely to make comment on, and which we hope we'll be able to discuss with the committee in, in due course. Yeah, um, the local senior officer is a statutory appointment. We have to appoint a local senior officer and their, their role uh, is absolutely to work in partnership with predominant local authority but also other local partners uh, to produce a, an agreed local plan uh, that's focused on driving down risk uh, in an appropriate way for that local community. Uh, that's the whole purpose behind uh, the local plan. Um, we have got the advantage being a large national service that we can draw uh, great economies of scale and great economies of scope, you know, the resources that we have available. Uh, but we have to remember that where we operate uh, day in, day out is at the local fire station level. Uh, it's the difference we make at a local level that really we will be judged on. Uh, so these are extremely important documents for us. Um, we support the, 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 the local senior officers with the resources they have in the area, but if there are specific things that they need to uh, address or get involved in, we can flex the organisation, resources can move in and can move out. Our local uh, senior officers uh, understand that. We're coming to the, the end uh, of the first three years of the service, so we'll be looking at this moment in time uh, to revise these documents. All the feedback we've had today is that they have been uh, valued and they have been useful, um, but we will not rest on our laurels with them. Uh, we need to make sure that they are meaningful at a local level. Uh, we have agreed, um, as a Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, an engagement framework uh, and how we will engage uh, at all levels, and part of that effective engagement, uh, I absolutely uh, will focus on ensuring that that makes these local plans meaningful and that these local plans make a difference and they have to connect up from us into the wider uh, community uh, planning partnership and that wider single outcome agreement. So if we get all these bits right, uh, I, I think that is an extremely valuable uh, local guide to how we will deliver services, but it needs to be informed by what the local need is what the local people's wants are of their fire and rescue service. Okay. Um, can I just move on more, more generally? Kind of two years after the uh, institution of the National Fire Service for Scotland, if you were asked to sum up uh, where we are now, how would you sum that up in kind of briefly? Um, I think that's a good question for a round-up question at well, the very yeah, end. So I'll leave that one yeah, for okay. you to do at the very end. And if we'll just part that and come back with it and let Gill in with a different one. <coughs> I, I need to declare an, an interest here because I'm going to talk about my business say, very, uh, uh, and not in any detail. But I've got 30 years of experience uh, seeing accident, uh, you know, the aftermath of accidents 
uh, in garages because we live off somebody else's misery and unfortunately we supply into the accident damage uh, 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 industry and uh, we supply the materials to repair the cars and mainly the paint. So my question is regards to training I, and I know how skilled uh, that uh, the, the rescue service is. Uh, it's got a fantastic, uh, it's miracles that you see, although we never have ever came in contact with fatalities. We just see what happens with all the people, you know, the cars where people are rescued. And I wondered, uh, I wanted to take you back to the actual impact of the reform and if there were any benefits uh, with regards to, to the reform in terms of training uh, for these highly skilled uh, 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 people that are involved in it, or indeed uh, if there's any negative impact in this, this type of work. If I could maybe open it up and then um, and invite uh, the Chief Officer to come in. Um, one of the, the benefits of bringing the uh, services together, including the, the, the training college, so that was nine organisations coming together, is that uh, the prior service of, of Trial Clyde had just opened a state-of-the-art, world-class training facility in Canvas Lang which is an organisation we, 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 we inherited. Um, I'd, I'd like to make the offer, Chair, if, if it's not too cheeky, but if the committee at any point you, wanted Waters. to visit our, our training facility, yes. can I say that you would, not, you, would not, you would come back not feel to be impressed by the type of equipment, the level of training and the quality of the facility we have in offer, yeah. mm -hmm. not only for the fire and rescue services, but we work in partnership on that with many other emergency mm -hmm. services, including police and ambulance. But uh, after that advertisement, I'll pass you over to No, no, well, I would like to take up your offer. We've just got so much legislation, we'd have to squeeze it in a weekend or something, but we'll, we'll certainly we'll consider it. it. We'll certainly consider it, yes. Um, there's no doubt about it that the quality of the, the training is one of the key elements and what ensures that firefighters are effective in delivering, uh, you know, to members of the public. Um, if I could just step back slightly, um, there are 46 different generic types of incident that firefighters would, would attend. That's, that's an assessment that's taken place. We have a comprehensive uh, training programme in place here within Scotland, uh, which many uh, colleagues in other parts of the UK uh, are envious of and we're willing to share with them that ensures that um, firefighters to a national occupational standard are trained to deal effectively with these 46 generic different types of risk. They've obviously all those risks are not actually uh, present in every station's area. So some of the remote rural parts of the country, there'd be no point in me training them in um, how to deal with trains, uh, high-rise buildings, you know, tunnels, that that type of stuff. So we focus on the needs um, of the individual firefighters within their station areas, what are the type of incidents they are likely to attend. So we have a comprehensive uh, training programme that ensures uh, that everybody gets that training. Um, on top of that, what we're uh, developing, and large parts of the country have this in place, but we, we, we will roll it out across the whole of the country, so this is a benefit uh, of reform, is that there are four key things. Uh, one is road traffic collision training. The other is breathing apparatus training. Uh, the other one is fire behaviour training. And the other one is actually a first person on the scene type first aid. So these four things, these four key areas, uh, unless you have got uh, the right level of training and your refresher training is up to date, then you shouldn't be crewing a frontline fire appliance. So we're working very hard to put that into place. Uh, so that comprehensive, the 46 generic assessments, plus these key areas, these ticket to ride things, uh, are extremely important, ensuring uh, the effectiveness of our firefighters. Uh, and, uh, and then on top of that, um, and this is another advantage of being a national service, is we have mapped where all the training facilities are across Scotland. Uh, we've mapped them against these generic uh, risks. Uh, and within an hour's travel, uh, we will provide facilities uh, so that firefighters can train safely and in a realistic way against each of these generic risks within Scotland. Uh, and then on top of all of that, as Pat has just mentioned, we genuinely have a world-class facility 
uh, here within Scotland at Cambus Lang, uh, and that is a centre of excellence. So firefighters uh, can access this, can use this in various courses, but probably more importantly, uh, the staff that support them, the instructors, the trainers, they can go there and, and they are trained to a level of excellence that they can then cascade at these local facilities around the country. Mr Thompson, you want to... First of all, thanks for your comments about our firefighters, my members, who are all very professional and very highly motivated, and they like to be professional. And they really like to do a good job and take great pride in that. One of the challenges I think we face as a single service is there were eight different delivery models for delivering training. And, and I think the challenges still lie and are still trying to be addressed in particularly the, the more rural areas, particularly H&I, etc. The further rural you go, the, the, diffi the more difficult it is to train, particularly to have the S staff. Um, again, we're working with the service to try and address that. However, I think I'd be duty bound to let you know there are still challenges there, despite you know, some of the best efforts, and some of them are, again, are budget budgetary driven. One of the things I was involved in was the training structures, the training department, how that was going to be structured. And I think that will be kept under review. Um, and it'll really depend how well these challenges are met, I think will uh, inform that review process. So it's just to keep you cited on that. that there is still a challenge, despite the good work that's been done. I take that on board. But there are challenges there as well. I can bear witness to your members' uh, expertise. I can, you know, it's 30 years of, of seeing it happen. But I, I just I'm interested in uh, that we are driving it down into local areas. Uh, and, you know, you know, I understand what you're saying. Money's money and resources are resources. Yeah. So but, I'll give you a little practical example yeah. of that, a very recent example, is we are now working in partnership with Highlands and Islands Airports Limited. Uh, so we've recently uh, built a realistic fire training facility. So uh, you'll see that if you've probably seen it in films, that if a firefighter opens a door and the air rushes in, the whole thing explodes. Yeah. Um, so how fire behaves in a compartment is 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 one of the most uh, risk critical parts of our and understanding that is one of the most risk, risk critical parts of a firefighter's job. We've recently opened a new facility uh, in Dundee, uh, but we are. Within this financial year, we will open a new facility uh, in Kirkwall, uh, in Stornoway and in Inverness. So you can see by that description, in terms of firefighters being able to access facilities that never had before, uh, <coughs> you know, we are focusing on that. And, and that goes back to the question about the retained firefighters. Uh, so in these areas like you know, uh, Kirkwall uh, and Stornoway, uh, previously they would have had to have come back you know, onto the mainland uh, you know, into uh, Inverness or Invergordon to do some of that training. Uh, now they can do it uh, at uh, a local uh, facility, which means we're not taking them off the islands. It reduces costs, it improves firefighter safety, and it makes the whole proposition more attractive. Maybe my question's a wee bit subjective, but do you think that would have happened without the reform, what you've just described? Um, I think that what reform has done uh, it's, it's enabled us to take a, a, a more strategic view uh, across Scotland. Uh, there are no boundaries. So we now have firefighters uh, using facilities uh, that would have been in another services area before. There was no reason why they couldn't have used them previously, but they didn't, uh, and now they do. Uh, so I think that is a distinct advantage of reform. Thanks for that. Oh, to move on, because time's pressing. Margaret, do you have a one? Yeah, just very briefly, you, the panel will be aware that there was a lot of anxiety and concern about the closure of, of some control rooms. Has there ever been uh, an occasion where a control room has been left without 24-hour um, cover? Um, certainly not that I'm aware of, Margaret. I mean, there... Um, the only closure that have happened up to now, although we have got more closures planned for later this year, has been the Dumfries and Galloway uh, closure. Can I say that it was absolutely seamless? Absolutely seamless to the closure. Um, we spoke to um, not only the, uh, the 
personnel in, in, in Dumfries and Gallaby, also the personnel in Johnson, where it was being transferred to, we may put options down to, um, personally, both myself and the chief and the trade union colleagues, I went down to speak to every individual member of staff when we were leading up to that closure, to see what was offered, where they could, if they wanted to may, remain within the service, how we could get achieve that, and we achieved that in every single case. Some people did take the opportunity to take early retirement or voluntary service, um, but can I say that that transfer has went absolutely seam seamless. We ran the two in conjunction for a period so that we were sure that the, the thing would work. It was a process that was, that was looked at by Dumfries and Galloway itself, uh, probably four years before reform. Dumfries and Galloway actually looked at marrying the, the two control rooms um, the, through the, um, the needs of the service. We have done that, and there will be other closures and amalgamations later on in the year. But the reason for the delay is we need to upskill uh, and update some of the, the other control rooms to allow that to happen. And that will not happen until after the summer and then we'll have a period of absolute testing it to destruction before we make the transfer. So no one on the panel is aware of the Johnson control <coughs> room being without 24-hour care uh, emergency cover or cover for a period of seven days. That, that's, that wasn't the case. Never. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's it. Um, thank you very much for your evidence. Oh, I beg your pardon. Oh, you. I'm so sorry. The grand finale. Your question. Yeah, you can all remember my question. No, I can't. Just again, well, please. Well, basically, you know, two years along the line, if you were summing up where we are with uh, the National Fire Service, how would you sum it up briefly? Right, I'll start, Mr. Thompson, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll start with no, Mr sorry, Hay. Sorry. I don't want to break the harmony. <laughs> there have been teething troubles. That's, that's, I think, goes without saying. Uh, it has been quite a challenging process for us, especially when you're talking about closing you know, control rooms. That's our members' jobs who have been, you know, despite the, the voluntary server and settler time, etc. That has been probably one of the biggest challenges for us. Another big challenge is the, the restructure of the officers, uh, the flexi duty system. That has been, you know, quite problematic for our officers, you know, changing workloads, increasing workloads. Um, so again, that's been another sort of pinch point. And I'm going to give you the bad news. The chief can give you the good news. So <laughs> the, the, that's been another challenge uh, for us. Um, I think I will give you some good news. I think there are benefits to come. I think there's some of them are still some way off. But I'm going to finish on the note I started and certainly my submission that we are extremely concerned about the cut to the fire service budget. We do believe mm -hmm. that if this continues, you will not have the frontline service and there will be reduction in the frontline, not only numbers, but outcomes, as, as is described. So, I mean, I did say in, in my submission that the first aim of reform is to protect and improve local services mm -hmm. despite financial cuts by stopping duplication and not cutting frontline outcomes. Well, the duplication has stopped and yet the cuts keep coming. Therefore, that means at some point, I believe, there will be a reduction in frontline outcomes. So on that, so no, I will leave it. But no, I, think that's important. No. I think that's important for you to hear. Of course. Uh, I'd be remiss of me not to say that. No, Thank no, you. absolutely. You're speaking for your members, and that's yeah. absolutely appropriate. Mr Torrey. Um, I had a, a conversation with a colleague this morning, which is really gets to the heart of that question, I think. And, and so I'll give you that. We, we were reflecting on the last two years of reform, the reduction in, in money that's available to Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Mr Hay said, I think, 48 point something million pounds has been taken out of the system. Of course, the committee knows that's the reality for the public sector in general. So the service has been experiencing reduced budgets in line with the whole of the mm. Scottish public sector. And the conversation this morning was, if reform hadn't happened, what would the position have been? So if we were in a position where there were eight fire and rescue services in a college trying to find nearly 50 million pounds of savings over the last two years, what the situation had been, and, and my judgment is that we would have been in a far, far worse position than we are now, and the Scottish Fire Rescue Service has done a pretty remarkable job, actually, in bringing that in, maintaining business as usual, and, and making progress. Mr Waters. I mean, certainly echoing some of the, the points that the, the, the inspector has made there, um, I think the opportunity to, to look at um, the service as a whole right throughout Scotland has been a valuable lesson for us in how we take it forward. I think probably um, 
working with, uh, I mean, even with the, the, the caveats that was laid down, the opportunity to work with our colleagues in the trade union to ensure that what we were doing is working in partnership to actually deliver a, an improvement to the outcomes for the people of Scotland has been an example of how it can be done. Uh, and I think that's something we can learn from um, going forward. But the really short answer to, to your question is, yes, we still have work to do. Um, yes, there are still going to be challenges. But right now, we're in a good place. Mr. Hay. Yep. Um, I think the challenge that was, um, you know, set for us by um, the Scottish government in, in, in this reform process, you know, first and foremost, it was to uh, protect frontline and to continue to improve frontline outcomes. Uh, there were 356 fire stations in Scotland prior to reform. There are still 356 fire stations in Scotland, and there will be at the end of this financial year. That's the reform period. And in terms of the outcomes improving, uh, every single uh, target that the government has set us, uh, we are either hitting it or we are moving in a positive direction um, towards it. Uh, the second thing that they asked us to do was to make sure that across Scotland uh, we gave people uh, more equitable access to some of these specialist resources that were asked about here today. Uh, we have delivered a plan to do that, and we've already started implementing that plan. So that's that that that's something we are delivering in terms of the benefits of reform. And that can and, and the final thing is that connection with local communities, making sure that as a national service, yes, we do deliver economies of scale, uh, we do deliver economies of scope, but we're meaningful at a local level. Uh, and I think through that network of fire stations, articulated within those local plans, we've got strong evidence that we're doing that. Uh, so we're being more effective uh, and we're being more efficient because we have reduced our cost base by nearly £50 million. So if we're more effective and we're more efficient, uh, and there are challenges ahead and our staff are the key, but I would certainly say this has been a success. You don't have a supplementary. No, I'm I don't want to upset you. Can I thank you very much yeah. for your evidence? And you've also reminded us and the public of the diversity of the rescue part of the fire and rescue service. And can I also see, echo uh, Gil, I'm sure others, is that we very much uh, recognise the work of frontline services in fire and rescue, road traffic, and all the work that you do in the rescue service, uh, you know, um, throughout Scotland. Uh, and thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you. I'll now move into private session as previously agreed. Thank you.